Well, today, the United States Supreme Court granted Donald Trump immunity for conduct described in exactly two paragraphs of a 130-paragraph indictment. The rest of the indictment against Donald Trump still stands as of tonight. And the Supreme Court has ordered the trial judge in the case, Tanya Chutkin, to hear testimony in the case from a very long list of potential witnesses to clarify if some of the remaining charges in the indictment might now fit into a new category created by the Supreme Court today, granting criminal immunity for some presidential conduct. That could lead Judge Chutkin to, in effect, be presiding over an examination of the evidence similar to or equal to what would occur in the prosecution in the trial, the actual trial of this case, when Prosecutor Jack Smith would be calling his prosecution witnesses to the witness stand in Judge Chutkin's courtroom, including Mike Pence, to take an oath and testify under oath to prove to the judge that the conduct described in the rest of the indictment is in no way immune from prosecution, even with the Supreme Court's new definition today. Unlike a trial, Donald Trump does not have to be present for that hearing, which could last weeks. So it would in no way interfere with his presidential campaign. The 6-3 decision identified two different fears on each side of that decision in the Supreme Court. The majority of the justices seem to fear a president living under the pressure of unreasonable criminal prosecutions, even though... That has never happened in the history of the country. And the minority of the justices fear a president they now see as, in effect, sanctioned to break the law. The majority called the minority's view, quote, fear-mongering on the basis of extreme hypotheticals about a future where the president feels empowered to violate federal criminal law. What the majority saw without today's ruling, this is what they fear, is, quote, the more likely prospect of an executive branch that cannibalizes itself with each successive president free to prosecute his predecessors, yet unable to boldly and fearlessly carry out his duties for fear that he may be next. Never mind that no president has ever, in any sense, prosecuted his predecessor. Has never happened. The majority of the court fears what has never happened, and the minority of the court fears what they have already seen happen in the Trump presidency. The Amy Comey Barrett, uh, who joined the majority in the case, disagreed with the majority on one point, and that is uh, the excluding any kind of evidence that involves an official act by the president. She, she raised the question of how that would destroy bribery prosecutions. She said this, excluding from trial any mention of the official act connected to the bribe would hamstring the prosecution to make sense of charges alleging a quid pro quo. The jury must be allowed to hear about both the quid and the quo. The presidential campaign is now the campaign of a former president who abused his power as president against the current president who has not abused that power and does not want any more power. Here is what President Biden said tonight about the Supreme Court opinion. Good evening. The presidency is the most powerful office in the world. It's an office that not only tests your judgment, perhaps even more importantly, it's an office that can test your character. Because you not only face moments when you need the courage to exercise the full power of the presidency, you also face moments where you need the wisdom to respect the limits of the power of the office of the presidency. This nation was founded on the principle that there are no kings in America. Each, each of us is equal before the law. No one, no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. With today's Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity, that fundamentally changed. 
for all, for all practical purposes. Today's decision almost certainly means that there are virtually no limits on what a president can do. This is a fundamentally new principle, and it's a dangerous precedent, because the power of the office will no longer be constrained by the law, even including the Supreme Court of the United States. The only limits will be self-imposed by the president alone. This decision today has continued the Court's attack in recent years on a wide range of long-established legal principles in our nation, from gutting voting rights and civil rights to taking away a woman's right to choose, to today's decision that undermines the rule of law of this nation. Nearly four years ago, my predecessor sent a violent mob to the U.S. Capitol to stop the peaceful transfer of power. We all saw with our own eyes. We sat there and watched it happen that day. Attack on the police, the ransacking of the Capitol, a mob literally hunting down the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Gallows erected to hang the Vice President, Mike Pence. I think it's fair to say it's one of the darkest days in the history of America. Now the man who sent that mob to the U.S. Capitol is facing potential criminal conviction for what happened that day. And the American people deserve to have an answer in the courts before the upcoming election. The public has a right to know the answer about what happened on January 6th before they asked to vote again this year. Now, because of today's decision, that is highly, highly unlikely. It's a terrible disservice to the people of this nation. So now, now the American people have to do what the courts should have been willing to do, but will not. The American people have to render a judgment about Donald Trump's behavior. The American people must decide whether Donald Trump's assault on our democracy on January 6th makes him unfit for public office in the highest office in the land. The American people must decide if Trump's embrace of violence to preserve his power is acceptable. Perhaps most importantly, the American people must decide if they want to entrust the president once again the presidency to Donald Trump, now knowing he'll be even more emboldened to do whatever he pleases whenever he wants to do it. You know, at the outset of our nation, it was the character of George Washington, our first president, to find the presidency. He believed power was limited, not absolute, and that power always resides with the people, always. Now, over 200 years later, with today's Supreme Court decision, once again, it will depend on the character of the men and women who hold that presidency that are going to define the limits of the power of the presidency, because the law will no longer do it. I know I will respect the limits of the presidential power as I have for three and a half years, but any president, including Donald Trump, will now be free to ignore the law. I concur with Justice Sotomayor's dissent today. She, here's what she said. She said, in every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law. With fear for our democracy, I dissent, end of quote. So should the American people dissent. I dissent. May God bless you all, and may God help preserve our democracy. Thank you. And may God protect our troops. Leading off our discussion tonight is Professor Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. Uh, professor, uh, it's the summer break at law schools, but I'm imagining students returning to constitutional law class uh, in the next semester. And what just happened to constitutional law? Well, it was rocked to its very basis. The Supreme Court of the United States turned the Constitution upside down in a very profound sense. The most fundamental principle on which the Constitution rests is that the law binds everyone, and the Constitution elaborates the structure of that law. Although it does contain some provisions in the so-called speech and debate clause, for immunizing senators and members of the House in certain limited circumstances. It doesn't give any immunity from 
ordinary criminal law to the president, the most powerful figure in our government. On the contrary, it is because he has such enormous power that he, like anyone else, must obey the criminal law. There are some people, including people at the Justice Department, who have written rules saying that you have to wait until the president leaves office before commencing a prosecution for crimes he commits while he's in office. But until today, no one has seriously claimed that absolute immunity for certain official acts would apply to the president. As Justice Jackson pointed out in a very powerful dissent, she dissented in addition to Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan joined the dissents. But Justice Jackson, in a very powerful dissent, said this whole business of drawing a line between official acts and unofficial acts and saying that if you're on the official side of the line, the president can essentially get away with murder. It's on the unofficial side that he might be prosecuted. She points out how that gets it upside down. It is exactly when the president is using the official powers that belong uniquely to that office that we should be most worried about the president becoming an autocrat, or as Donald Trump told us, he wants to be on day one a dictator. So the court has it backwards. It is true that the case will go back to Judge Chapkin. She'll hold hearings. Some think that's kind of a silver lining because those hearings can become can begin soon, and the nation can perhaps see much sooner than it otherwise would if there had been a trial in the fall. The nation can see more of the evidence about what Donald Trump did in the fake elector scheme and in the violent mob that he riled up. Uh, but that's a pale substitute for what the people are entitled to, and that is a verdict guilty or not guilty, is the president guilty of, for the first time in our history, organizing an effort to prevent the peaceful transfer of power to his successor? That we won't have. People will be going to their voting booths and deciding whether to vote for someone who has already abused these powers, as opposed to someone who, though the powers have been handed to him, says, I don't want to use them. I believe in the rule of law. Voters well, will be making that choice without the evidence they need. Uh, I want to read uh, Justice Brown's, uh, just, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson's, uh, the conclusion of her opinion. The, she says, the majority of my colleagues seem to have put their trust in our court's ability to prevent presidents from becoming kings through case-by-case -case application of the indeterminate standards of their new presidential accountability paradigm. I fear that they are wrong, but for all of our sakes, I hope that they are right. In the meantime, because the risks and power the court has now assumed are intolerable, unwarranted, and plainly antithetical to bedrock constitutional norms, I dissent. Uh, dissent language doesn't get stronger than that. Well, the language couldn't get stronger because it deserves to be enormously strong. That language was uttered just three days before Independence Day. In several days, we will celebrate the nation's survival of a revolution against kings and queens. We had a revolution so that we wouldn't have a king. And now the Supreme Court says, that's what we're giving you. I don't think we should accept that present, but it seems to me that all that does is basically put the court on the ballot this November. We have to decide whether we want the kind of government that Donald Trump has helped us have by appointing three members to this court, because three of the members of the majority were appointed by him, and two members of the majority um, 
ought to have recused themselves, Alito and Thomas. Mm -hmm. That's five justices. And it's those five who ultimately decided that even the evidence of official acts couldn't be used to show what the president was up to when he used his official powers. Because motive supposedly doesn't matter, but motive is everything. Whether a president gave a pardon uh, in return for a bribe depends on whether he was doing it as a corrupt matter or whether he was giving a pardon because he thought someone deserved mercy. As Justice Barrett pointed out, you can't really make sense of the quid without the quo. And yet, under the incoherent decision of the majority, you can prove the transfer of money, but you can't prove anything about the pardon that was given in exchange. That's the kind of thing that makes this decision so incoherent. And what makes it really dangerous is that even if we eventually get over Trumpism and the MAGA movement, we will have to rely on the good character of future presidents, because the law will no longer serve as a source of inhibition. That's dangerous. That's a prescription for autocracy and eventually for authoritarianism and dictatorship. Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, thank you very much for starting off our discussions on this historic night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. And coming up, Neil Katyal, Andrew Weissman, and Melissa Mari will join us with their view of today's Supreme Court ruling. Joining our discussion now, Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General who has argued over 50 cases before the United States Supreme Court. He's a professor at Georgetown Law and host of the podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal. Also joining us, Andrew Weissman, former FBI General Counsel and former Chief of the Criminal Division in the Eastern District of New York. And Melissa Murray is joining us. She is also an NYU law professor, as is Andrew. They are the co-authors of the New York Times best-selling book, which I used tonight, the Trump indictments, the historic charging documents with commentary. All three, of course, are MSNBC legal analysts. Uh, Neil Katyal, with all of your Supreme Court experience, uh, how much of this did you expect? Almost none of it. This is a decision that um, was, I think, wrong start to finish. Uh, it won that really, I think, changed our Constitution dramatically, so, <clears throat> both procedurally and substantively, I'm frankly shocked. Substantively, the idea that a president can do whatever he wants, including and up to is sending out Navy SEAL Team 6 to assassinate his political rival, is certainly not the Constitution that I've ever understood. It's not the Constitution of the United States. This court's decision goes way, way, way too far in giving the president basically carte blanche when it comes to executive powers. There are some bright lines and the bright, bright silver lines findings in there about, for example, the president's role over state legislatures and assembly of fake delegates, which I think that the court leaves uh, possible to prosecute people like Donald Trump for. But in general, when it comes to presidential powers, this is not the Constitution that I have ever understood it to be. Sub procedurally, I would have expected a unanimous decision or close to unanimous. That's the way the court traditionally operates in hot button cases like this. If you go back to, for example, the Nixon tapes case, which was, you know, almost almost unanimous against Nixon and rejecting his claims of presidential privilege, um, which was just a weak cousin of what Donald Trump sought here. Even Nixon's own appointees to the Supreme Court ruled against him. Here, by contrast, you have the six Republican justices, Republican appointed justices, uh, all siding with the Republican nominee for the presidency, Donald Trump, and you have the three democratically appointed ones siding the other way. That is not the place the court should be. It's not surprising that we've already heard from President Biden about this, and I expect in the days and weeks to come, the court will become the front and centerpiece of the election. I think Biden will run against the court more than he'll run against even Donald Trump, although the two now 
are locked kind of at the hip, Trump and the Supreme Court. So this is a tremendously unfortunate ruling, Lawrence, and one as to which I was shocked. Yeah, I think so many of us uh, during our lifetimes have come to expect so much of the court because we saw the court deliver in circumstances that proved the court's integrity. The Republican President Richard Nixon proved the Supreme Court's integrity and now former Republican President Donald Trump has disproved it. Uh, Andrew, that, that, it, without that Supreme Court decision in the Nixon case, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here so stunned tonight as we, as we are. Yeah, look, as we talked about off air, in many ways, this decision sort of quietly reverses the entire logic of the Nixon tapes case. Um, because you have this broad um, recognition by the Supreme Court that anything that is within a very expansive view of the core functions or the take care clause of the Constitution um, is completely and 100 percent absolutely immune. And then even other official acts, there's a strong presumption um, where the court sets out a very difficult test to allow the government to go forward. But let me just make a, a sure people understand, with respect to that core function where the court says it is absolutely immune, they say one of the things within that core function is the communications and the directions of the president and the Department of Justice. So they say that when a president orders sham prosecutions, he can do that and not face any criminal repercussions. Just that is just to say it is to be shocked by it. Um, I am completely with Neil. This is this is this is such a transformational um, decision. Finally, the the um, tape that you played of President Biden is so remarkable because you have the sitting president saying, "I do not want." that power. I should not have that power. That is not how our system works. The sitting president is saying this is not part of the checks and balances that we have in this country. We are not an autocracy. It is remarkable, just as an institutional and historical matter, that you have President Biden on the day of the decision saying, I do not need and I should not have that power. Uh, Melissa Mari, you, you clerked for uh, Sonia Sotomayor. She made the point uh, in her dissent that every president prior to Donald Trump, every one of them assumed that criminal law applied to them, every one of them. Uh, they were not inhibited in any way as presidents, uh, as law-abiding people are not inhibited uh, by the fact that law applies to them. Uh, how do you think uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, has, has been dealing with this opinion and the length of time it took to get it out? What, what was going on? It, what can you imagine going on inside the court to take this long? Well, Lawrence, I don't think we have to imagine it. I think she told us a few weeks ago when she received the Radcliffe Medal in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she said that there are days where she goes back to her office and she cries. Um, cries because this court, of which she is a member, has done something so shocking, so beyond the pale, that it beggars belief. And I, I think this is one of those days. She chose to read her dissent from the bench. Again, that is an unusual step that they take only when they feel that it's really necessary to impress upon the public how monumental the majority's views are. Um, she also, I, I think, quite rightly noted that this is a major hit to democracy. And she noted that she did not respectfully dissent. She simply dissented, noting the bad and sad times for democracy ahead. I wasn't entirely shocked by this decision. This is a Supreme Court that has had a six to three conservative supermajority for about four years. And in three of those four years, it has overruled a major precedent every single year. Dobbs in 2022, the affirmative action cases in 2023, the Chevron case this year. And now it's essentially abandoned Nixon versus United States. It's not done so explicitly, but this mm -hmm. is a sub rosa overruling of Nixon. Who would have ever thought that we would be in a position like this, where the Supreme Court of the United States, so emboldened by its near numbers, 
could simply run roughshod over the rule of law, over stare decisis, over existing precedents. That's what Donald Trump put in place. And I agree with Neil. I am surprised the Biden administration has not taken a more strident view about this court and its role in constructing these current landscape that we live in. But this is not just about the threat that Donald Trump poses to democracy. This court by itself is an existential threat to democracy. Uh, let's Lawrence, all just could, go ahead, Neil, quickly. We'll go to a break after if that. If I could just pick up on that. Please I do. mean, you know, the most important book in constitutional law is Alexander Bickle's book, These Dangerous Branch. And the argument of the book is that the court does its best by not doing a lot at any one time. It conserves its legitimacy. And what you have here is the opposite, what Melissa elsewhere has called the YOLO court, which they're overruling precedent after precedent after precedent because they have the numbers. And what Bickle predicts is the institutional collapse of the Supreme Court and its legitimacy. And unfortunately, that's what we are now seeing. And it's the court's fault. They're putting themselves in the headlights of all of these major decisions, like the ones Melissa mentions. This uh, opinion does read like a mess. Uh, and the question is, how big are the holes in it? And how much can Judge Chutkin get through those holes? We'll take up that question after this break. And we're back with Melissa Murray, Neil Katyal, and Andrew Weissman. Uh, and Andrew, I, I wanted to read a part of the oral argument in this case, in which Justice Roberts appeared to disagree with his opinion today and agree with uh, Justice Barrett's uh, dissent from this element of it in, involving uh, the so-called official act. Uh, it, during the argument, Justice Roberts said, if you expunge the official part from the indictment, how do you, I mean, that's like a one-legged stool, right? I mean, giving somebody money isn't bribery unless you get something in exchange. And if what you get in exchange is to become the ambassador to a particular country, that is official. The appointment, it's within the president's prerogative. Uh, and Andrew, uh, today, in this opinion, uh, Justice, uh, Justice Roberts just seems to have forgotten all of that. Yeah, so this is going to be quite important, both at the federal level and at the state level, where we have this new brief, um, or actually this letter to the DA saying that the, you know, there should be a hearing and evidence can be thrown out, and, it, um, and Trump is trying to sort of relitigate that. Why? Because the Supreme Court, in the majority, said that if there are official acts that are immune, then none of that can come in as even evidence. And that is something that, as you note, Chief Justice Roberts really took to task the Justice Alito comment saying that that's Justice Alito's view. And he was like scoffing at that, saying that's going to make it almost impossible to prosecute sort of public corruption cases, because how do you prove the quid to the quo or the quo to the quid? Um, and yet he joins the majority. Now, I should note that um, Amy Coney Barrett, in her concurrence, dissents on that ground. And she says she would allow that evidence. So you have four justices, actually, on that point saying that that would be, that it should be allowed. And as I said, that is going to be the argument that there was official evidence, evidence of official acts by the president that came into the state trial in New York. So you can expect that that's what we're going to start hearing about. There are a number of counter arguments that the state um, will make, um, including that that is an argument that's waived um, and that there was de minimis evidence, but that opened the door to that argument. And this is really just a sort of crazy argument. And I don't I really do not know why the chief justice flipped on that after being so strong in the oral argument. OK, so the Supreme Court is sending this back to Judge Chutkin and basically ordering her to have hearings, evidentiary hearings, where she's going to have to listen to witness testimony. She's going to have to listen to basically the, the, the prosecution case. Uh, and here is some, just some. Uh, there's an awful lot that the Supreme Court wants her to find out. But here's just some of what they want her, her to find out about January 6th, for example, whether the tweets, that speech, and Trump's other communications on January 6th involve official conduct, may depend 
on the content and context of each, knowing, for instance, what else was said contemporaneous to the excerpt of communications or who was involved in transmitting the electronic communications and in organizing the rally could be relevant to the classification of each communication. This necessarily fact-bound analysis is best performed initially by the district court. We therefore remand to the district court to determine whether this alleged conduct is official or unofficial. Uh, and, and so, Melissa, that sounds like a full-blown trial just on January 6th alone. And this indictment also includes 42 mentions of Arizona, 48 mentions of Georgia, 39 mentions of Michigan, and so on, Nevada, New Mexico, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. This is a massive factual undertaking for all of the rest of the indictment, which does sound like a full presentation of the prosecution's case. Well, it'll certainly be an opportunity for a hearing in open court. And Andrew has a terrific op-ed in The New York Times detailing how this could serve as a kind of public adjudication, certainly not a trial by jury, but maybe the best we can hope for, given the compressed timeline going into the election. Um, so that could be a silver lining to this. But I will note... The court did the unusual step here of highlighting some of the various allegations in the indictment and providing what it called guidance as to how the lower court might resolve some of these questions. So, for example, with regard to the communications with Mike Pence and uh, former President Trump's entreaties to Mike Pence to overturn the Electoral College votes, uh, the, the court basically said that those should be considered official actions, presumptively immunized, and then it would be left to the government to meet the very high bar of rebutting that presumption of immunity. So again, the court has perhaps put a thumb on the scale here by directing how the, the lower court should receive some of this evidence. And with regard to the point that Andrew just made about the evidentiary issue, I will just note that Justice Alito, who I think an argument could be made, should have been recused here, provided the crucial fifth vote for that view that any evidence or actions that were previously immunized because they were official action could not be then used as evidence to prove the crimes that were not subject to immunity. So that would not have been on the table if Justice Alito had not been in the majority and if Justice Thomas had also been forced to recuse. Uh, Neil, uh, the, Judge Shutkin already uh, took the view that everything in that indictment reads to her like a chargeable crime against a former president of the United States. Uh, she is now given the task by the Supreme Court to decide again, are these chargeable crimes uh, given our new framework uh, to, to use looking at this indictment. I, I'm not sure what prevents Judge Chutkin from finding all of it to be a chargeable crime, other than the only item in there uh, that the Supreme Court eliminated, which is just those two, uh, paragraph 74, paragraph 77 of the indictment. So you're right, Lawrence, that the Supreme Court today said the allegations about Trump pressuring the Justice Department to try and impugn the 2020 election and its integrity, that that was somehow an official act and can't be touched by the criminal law. That's a crazy holding, but nonetheless, that's what they've said. With respect to the other allegations, like pressuring uh, Vice President Pence or even pressuring other people, there might be some presumptive immunity, they said, but that is fully within Judge Chutkin's control. And there is this important line in the chief's opinion, and I expect Jack Smith, the special counsel, to really harp on what the chief justice said here. He said, quote, there may be, however, contexts in which the president, notwithstanding the prominence of his position, speaks in an unofficial capacity perhaps as a candidate for office or a party leader. And many of the allegations here go to that. Take, for example, the claim that Trump pressured state legislatures to have their fake electors scheme. That is not something that is an official act any day of any week. The U.S. president has no control over state legislatures. It is fully within the states. That's part of our system of federalism. So those allegations in the complaint, I expect Judge Chutkin to find rather easily, will, will survive the decision today. And I expect, as Andrew predicted in his New York Times piece, I suspect that we will see a fair amount of evidence 
that the American people can listen to and hear about what Donald Trump did when it comes to those kinds of allegations. What they won't be able to hear is more evidence, for sure, on the pressuring Donald Trump did over the Justice Department, because the Supreme Court has now declared that off limits. All right, we're going to squeeze in one more quick break right here. We'll be right back with Neil, Andrew, and Melissa. Back with us, Neil Katyal, Andrew Weissman, and Melissa Murray. And I just want to read uh, from page 52 of this book, The Trump Indictments, by Melissa Murray and Andrew Weissman. This is uh, paragraph 74 in the indictment. This will have to be, uh, be struck from the indictment according to the absolute immunity uh, provision that the court uh, came up with today. It says, that afternoon, the defendant, Donald Trump, called the acting attorney general and acting deputy attorney general and said, among other things, people tell me co-conspirator four is great. I should put him in. The defendants also raised, the defendant also raised multiple false claims of election fraud, which the acting attorney general and acting deputy attorney general refuted when the acting attorney general told the defendant that the Justice Department could not and would not change the outcome of the election, the defendant responded, quote, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and Republican congressmen. And the reason the Supreme Court said that's a completely legal and immunized uh, conversation is because at a certain point in the conversation, uh, Donald Trump was talking about possible hiring and firing and appointment power at the Justice Department, and that that justifies uh, the, everything else that he says in it, no matter how criminal uh, that might sound. Uh, that That's what this indictment is going to be losing as a result of this. Uh, Melissa Murray, there's another paragraph on the other page uh, with another conversation Donald Trump has. But there's a bunch of other conversations right in that section of the indictment that do not involve the president, that involve the uh, deputy attorney general, the acting attorney general, and then uh, this the the attorney the other guy who you know who uh, Donald Trump is thinking of making an attorney general. All of that is happening among them. Does that have to be cut out of this indictment too? The president is not in any of those conversations. It's a really good question, Lawrence. Um, I actually read that part of the court's decision as sort of a unitary executive theory on steroids. The unitary executive theory, which has been advanced by a number of conservatives, is this idea that the executive branch and the president, um, the president is the embodiment of the executive branch. So the Department of Justice, for example, the attorney general, those are all appendages of the president. And so the theory that, as I understand it, and as it's expressed in the opinion, is that in those circumstances where the president is talking to DOJ officials or simply directing things toward the DOJ officials, those are official acts because the president himself is the embodiment of the DOJ. He alone is responsible and directs the DOJ. And so I think that's really significant in this case, not just for what it means for this indictment and what is what is ruled out as immunized, but also what it means for the special counsel and all of these prosecutions going forward, because essentially the court is saying if the president, if he is reelected, um, and becomes the president again, if Donald Trump is the president, he can then direct the DOJ to drop these prosecutions. And that direction is an official act. It cannot be challenged. It cannot be subject to criminal prosecution. He can release the special counsel. That, too, is part of his official duties as president. He can remove the special counsel. All of that is within the, in the scope of his official duties, not presumptively immune, but absolutely immune. And I think that is a sweeping, sweeping, sweeping set of circumstances, especially with regard to the DOJ. Uh, Neil, the uh, Supreme Court, in the majority opinion, says the president is a branch of government. Absolutely. It's a branch of government, but not that doesn't mean that it's a branch of government that exists exogenous to law. And the idea that a president could do the kinds of stuff that you read in paragraph 74 on pressuring the Justice Department to impugn the election and install his, you know, uh, his preferred candidate for acting attorney general to do that is so dangerous. And here, 
Lawrence, I want to remind everyone of Justice Jackson, not Justice Katanji Jackson, but Justice Robert Jackson, because when the Japanese internment case came up to the Supreme Court, he dissented, saying, look, the power the majority is going to give here to the president is going to lie around like a loaded weapon for some other president to pick up and use in some horrendous way. And I fear exactly that about this decision. This is not just about Donald Trump. This is not about Joe Biden or Merrick Garland or Jack Smith. This is about the most fundamental thing we have as Americans, which is life under the rule of law, the idea that no person's above the law, the idea that a president can't act exogenous to law, that he's constrained by the law. And what the court did today is blow past and destroy that fundamental underpinning of our system. I don't think this decision is going to last. I don't think that we will have five or six justices in the future who can sign on to what is basically nonsense. Um, and it's institution, it's not America, and it shouldn't survive the test of time. Neil Katyal, Andrew Weissman, and Melissa Mari, thank you very much for joining us on the for the most important discussion this program has ever had about a Supreme Court opinion. Thank you very much. That is tonight's last word. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.